Well, next up we have Dan Mitchell, a real treat, excellent orator, always giving <coughs> exciting presentations. I know you're going to like him. Let me give you a few more details about his credentials. He was a long time at the Heritage Foundation, worked for Senator Bob Atwood, Citizens for a Sound Economy. He's currently Senior Fellow at the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C. His work has been published virtually everywhere. If you haven't seen it, you don't read the papers or watch TV. It's as simple as that. And Dan's going to talk to us a little more on his views of Social Security and Medicare over the long term. Share your insights with us, please. Welcome, Dan Mitchell. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad I uh, am, I'm not last because uh, a lot of the material has already been stolen by the first two speakers. By the time we get to poor Maya, uh, I don't know how much is left to say. Um, but I want to touch on a couple of things that, uh, that Steve and Doug uh, didn't get a chance to really mention. Uh, first, I want to start with a couple of broad observations. Our problem is not deficits of debt. Our problem is spending. Whether you take resources out of the productive sector of the economy through taxes, whether you take resources out of the productive sector of the economy with borrowing, the economic damage occurs because you're allocating resources politically rather than through market forces. I don't want to be Sweden, which has a balanced budget but a huge government and living standards 30 to 40 percent below us, and I don't want to be Greece, which has a much bigger government but finances a lot of that uh, with borrowing. In both cases, living standards are lower, growth prospects are worse, societies are slowly but surely decaying. I mean, the Scandinavians do the welfare state much better than the Greeks, but I don't want to be in either one of those uh, uh, situations. I'd much rather try to uh, restore American exceptionalism, individual freedom, personal responsibility. I also want to make the point that this is not a partisan problem. We had a budget of 18.2% of GDP when Bill Clinton left office. It's now 25% of GDP, and the vast majority of that was under Bush. Government spending was uh, $1.8 trillion, roughly, when Clinton left office. When Bush left office, it was up around $3.4, $3.5 trillion. Republicans can waste money sometimes just as good as Democrats. I don't care whether you have an R after your name, a D after your name, or whether you're polka dots. Uh, if you're making government big, you're doing the wrong thing for the country. And we all criticize Obamacare. We should be equally critical of the prescription drug benefit. We criticize Obama's stimulus. We should have been criticizing Bush's Keynesian plan in 2008, not to mention all the other things he did, from no bureaucrat left behind to the pork-filled transportation bills, the corrupt agriculture bills, you name it, government spending is the problem, no matter what your party uh, affiliation is. Now, the good news, the good news is that the problem is actually very simple to solve. Now, that's not the same as it being easy to solve, but it's very simple to solve. If you look at the Congressional Budget Office 10-year forecast, you'll see that even if you permanently extend the Bush tax cuts and permanently hold the AMT where it is now so you're not sweeping more people into the system, revenues are going to grow an average of 7% a year. Now, I'm not a math genius, but if revenues are growing on average 7% a year, what do we have to do to reduce red ink? Obviously, you just need to make sure government spending grows by less than 7% a year. If you froze government spending uh, at the current levels, you'd actually balance the budget by 2017, 1% annual growth, 2019, 2% annual growth, 2021, which is the 10-year uh, CBO forecast window. Now, here's the challenge. We do budgeting in a baseline for format in Washington, where you assume all previously legislated increases in spending. So you start with the assumption that government spending might be growing up by five, six, seven, eight percent a year. And so therefore, when you have a responsible lawmaker who says, well, inflation is about two percent a year, why don't we limit government spending to the rate of inflation? That somehow gets translated into a four or five or a six percent cut, which you add up over the 10 year period. And that's where you get these absurdly dishonest headlines about trillions of dollars of spending cuts. No, government's actually getting bigger every year under these plans, just not growing as fast as the previous plans to increase spending. But people say to me, well, okay, yeah, sure, 
that they do budgeting in a dishonest way in Washington, but that actually represents something. It represents the fact that we have made all these legal commitments with entitlement programs. And yes, we do have to increase spending 8% more every year because of Medicare and Medicaid. And we have to increase spending 6% more every year because of Social Security. And they say, you know, how on earth can we possibly uh, have government only grow 2% a year? Well, we've done things like that in the past. During the Reagan years, we reduced domestic spending, which is you know, domestic discretionary and entitlements combined, total domestic spending was reduced from, uh, I think it was 15.3% of GDP to 12.7% of GDP. Domestic spending under Bill Clinton was reduced by 1% of GDP. During the four year period, the mid 1990s, the combination of Bill Clinton and a Republican Congress, total government spending grew by an average of 2.9% a year. If we could simply do that from this point forward, and just keep revenue at 7% a year on average, we'd solve our fiscal problem. And th this is for people who think deficits and debt are the fiscal problem. I'm more concerned about letting the private sector grow faster than the government. So the main variable that we should be really focusing on is government spending as a share of GDP. But it's not just that we have some good examples from Reagan and Clinton of what to do. And of course, bad examples, Bush and Obama, which is really just a seamless uh, policy of big government under both of them. I don't blame Doug, by the way. Uh, he says that he's, you know, he goes to confession every day, and he says by the time we get to 2085, he's going to fully uh, uh, be forgiven for all his sins, uh, just for being a so he, he was one of the good guys uh, in the administration. Um, there were there were some good ones, uh, but let me go ahead and just cite a few international examples to show that it is possible that good fiscal policy. This is all based on data from the Economist Intelligence Unit. Uh, in 19, from 1986 to 1989, Ireland had a four-year period where government spending did not go up by one penny. 14.7 billion euro in 1986, 14.7 billion euro in 1989. Now, some of you smart people, wait, they didn't have euros back then. Well, they'd gone back and adjusted all their numbers for euros. But a hard, flat freeze on government spending for a four-year period. New Zealand did the same thing for five years. Between 1990 and 1995, government spending actually fell. Uh, not by much, but you know, it was more than a hard freeze. Government spending fell. Now what's interesting, if you look at these examples of what happened in Ireland, Ireland's budget deficit, for those of you who think the deficit's the most important thing, their deficit fell from 12.7% of GDP down to 2.7% of GDP. Uh, New Zealand went from a deficit of 5% of GDP to a surplus of 3% of GDP. When you restrain spending, you're not only doing the right thing for the economy, you also are dealing with the symptom of excessive spending, which is government borrowing, and that problem gets solved as well. Canada is another example. Between 92 and 97, government spending grew by an average in nominal dollars of just 1% a year. As a result, they went from a big deficit to a small surplus. Uh, and last but not least, Slovakia. I like citing them because they're such a good example because they've done flat tax, social security, personal retirement accounts. They're sort of trying to become the Hong Kong of Eastern Europe. Slovakia had a three-year period uh, where government spending uh, only grew 1% a year. And as a result, the burden of government spending went from 37% of GDP down to 29% of GDP. Their deficit went from 8% of GDP down to 2% of GDP. So whether you properly understand that government spending is what we need to fix, or whether you're mistakenly focusing on the symptoms of deficit and debt, it doesn't matter because the right policy in either case is restraining the growth of spending. Now the specifics, of course, is the challenge. Because we do have all these promises, we have demographic changes, that's sort of baked into the cake that we have this growing government. And by the way, if we don't solve this problem, we're going to be Greece. I mean, there's nothing magical about America where we can have bloated government without having the horrible consequences of a weak economy and a population that's riddled by dependency. Uh, we're gonna be in the same mess with the social disarray, the chaos, the rioting, uh, if we don't solve this problem. Fortunately, we know the solution. In the long, especially in the long run, we know that we need social security, personal retirement accounts. Steve made a great point. It's not just that we wanna make the program solvent because the program's a terrible program. Uh, especially for young people. You're being told to pay state prices in order to get a McDonald's hamburger. Uh, why not let you opt out? Yes, there's gonna be a big transition cost. The transition cost of paying older workers and current retirees who are gonna be stuck with the current system. But that transition cost 
uh, certainly can't possibly be as much as the cost of bailing out the program uh, in the long run. Now, Medicaid, that's simple, just block grant it. Medicare, more of a challenge, but we need to voucherize it, a premium support plan, as Doug was talking about. Now, the challenge is, in the short run, how much of that can you do uh, to affect people immediately if you're looking for short-term budget savings? And that's a political challenge for people on the Hill. I'll obviously take every penny I can get, but I'm much more concerned about what are the implications 10 years, 20 years, and 30 years from now. Because that's when we're going to be greased if we don't fix these programs. I'd rather go ahead and give these programs a bit of a pass over the next five years if I could get the real, permanent, long-run reforms because that's what we desperately uh, need. And one final comment I just want to make about health care. A lot of people say, well, you really don't, you can't do anything about Medicare and Medicaid because there's something about health care. It's so technology intensive, prices are always going to go up. And a lot of people nod their head, they just think that's true. Well, here's something that's technology intensive. There's probably more computing program in this, power in this BlackBerry than in the original moon rockets. And yet, the cost of computer equipment keeps going down every year. So you could have more and more technology at lower and lower prices when markets are allowed to operate. And Doug touched on the fact that we had this horrible third party payer program in healthcare. If you look at the figures from the uh, Health and Human Services, 88 cents out of every healthcare dollar in America is paid for someone other than the consumer. Now think about it. If I tell all of you, wherever you go to dinner tonight, Dan Mitchell, he's a real idiot. He's going to pay 88% of your bill. Are you more likely to go to McDonald's or are you more likely to go to Morton's? Well, unless you're a, well, Doug just whispered McDonald's. Like he's, he's a great guy. But the rest of you are going to be smart. You're going to say, we're going to go to Capitol Grill or Morton's or 1789 or, you know, what are some of these expensive restaurants that I never get to go to because I'm just a think tank guy. Unless, do you have some lobbyist friends who think me know? No, we'll talk about that later. Um, we do have a few areas of our healthcare system, and I'll shut up on this, where markets are still allowed to operate. Cosmetic surgery, laser eye surgery, and whatever you think about the issue, abortion. And what do we find in those different markets where people actually pay out of pocket? we find that costs actually are less than the CPI. And yet we've had, you know, I don't know whether there's actually technological changes in abortion, but we've certainly had massive technological improvements in things like laser eye surgery, cosmetic surgery. So in the healthcare, parts of our healthcare system, the very small parts of our healthcare system, where we actually allow market forces to function, costs are not going up, consumer satisfaction is high, quality is good, it's where government is involved either directly through Medicare and Medicaid or through the government's imposed distortions through the tax code because of the health care exclusion. That's our problem. So yes, we have to voucherize Medicare, block grant Medicaid, but then we have to figure out how to get to a system where individuals are actually in charge of their own money because that's the only way in the long run we fix the problem with health care. Thank you.